there's way more communication now between coach and player than it was when I was coming up as a player. Like I said, it was either my way or the highway. Stop asking so many questions. Go execute. Now, these kids aren't raised that way anymore. So when you are, and I shouldn't say kids, I should say people aren't raised that way anymore. They want an explanation for what you're asking them to do and how it is going to affect their lives. Well, welcome to the show, Craig. Great to have you. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we know you launched a new podcast called Ways to Win. Can you share what's the inspiration behind the show and what you hope the audience takes away from it? Yeah. So, AJ, the inspiration was, you know, I am the executive director of the National Association of Basketball Coaches, and we have 5,000 members, and they're basketball coaches ranging from Division One all the way down to high school. So NAIA coaches, Division Two, Division Three. We have some grassroots coaches or AAU coaches. We have junior college coaches. And just all during my life, I've had the benefit of being coached, starting with my parents all the way to right now when I'm, I'm still getting coached by former coaches and by my members. And it came to me that most people don't get access to the kind of coaching that we have to offer. So we thought, how cool would it be to have a couple of coaches talk about life lessons they learned and how folks who are not in the sports realm can take advantage of the same coaching philosophies and lessons and all the things as athletes have had the benefit of for many years. So that was the initial premise. And then once we started going, people were like, you know, there isn't anything like this. So we've been very fortunate to have some really cool guests on. We haven't been on as long as you guys, but in the short period of time, it's been really fun. We've gotten really good feedback and it allows me to do really cool things like coming on the Art of Charm. <laughs> Well, we're happy to have you. And I know for a lot of our audience members, they might not be athletes or coaches, but they are looking to make the jump in their career from individual contributor to leader. And you were a player who then moved to coaching. And that transition is very similar when you go from individual skills and contributing to now leading a team. So can you talk a little bit about your own journey and then what your philosophy is around how to be a better leader? Yeah, you know, I, I have to be honest with you guys that I my my road is less traveled, right? I didn't come up the traditional way of getting into coaching where you're a former player and then you, when you're done playing, you become sort of a director of basketball operations or a dope, you know, we call them dobos or a video coordinator and you just kind of work your way up. The story I always tell is that, you know, I was playing in college at Princeton University and I had a, a really good career there. We had a really good team. I was fortunate enough to get drafted into the NBA, but not good enough to play in the NBA. So I got cut, but I did play professionally overseas. And my coach was a guy by the name of Tom Becker, who was an American coaching in Manchester, England. And now it's funny, my apartment was right near the Manchester City football field. <laughs> Back then, nobody knew what that was. You know, yeah. we're talking 35, 40 years ago, right? Nobody knew what that was. Now everybody knows what that is. And, and we used to go to those matches and it was a fight after every match. I mean, it was just like you went to a fight and a soccer match broke <laughs> out, right? But I digress. But this guy, Tom Becker, knew of my college coach, Pete Carrill. And he asked me when I got over there, he said, would you mind putting in some of that Princeton offense stuff? I absolutely love it, but I've never had anybody who's been able to teach it. So I, here I am, a 21-year-old kid, putting in an offense with a bunch of pro athletes, right? And and so I do it, and I, it a light bulb goes off of my head, and I'm like, this is really neat. We had a great season. I think I want to be a coach. So I travel back to the United States. On my way back home to Chicago, I stop off at Princeton visit my old teammates, visit my sister who's still there, visit my coach. And I sit down with my coach and I say, coach, I know what I want to be. I want to be a coach. And he says to me, in, like he's furious. He's like, 
coach, you don't want to be an effing coach. And he didn't say effing, right? He just went, he lit into me. And I was devastated, right? Because here I am thinking I had figured out what I wanted to do. And the one of the my my mentors tells me I can't do it. And I actually thought he didn't think I'd be a good coach. But what he was doing was he was, this is what he said. Here you are, a young black guy from the south side of Chicago with a Princeton degree, and you can't give up basketball. So he was actually thinking he was being a counselor to me and not and, and expanding my horizons. And he said to me, I'll tell you when you can be a coach. And I left his office, being the dutiful player that I was, and I went and got a job working in finance. And I did that for 14 years, right? And But I always thought, once I went into finance, I was working on Wall Street, and then I worked for a Wall Street firm in Chicago as a, a bond trader. And once I started realizing the kind of money you could make in that, I was thinking, okay, if I do this right, I save my money. When I hit the age of 50, 55, I can retire from this. I can teach seventh grade and I can coach high school basketball. That was my plan. But before I got anywhere near the end of that, one of the assistant coaches at Princeton got the head coaching job at Northwestern University in Chicago, called me up, offered me a job. And that is how I made the transition from player to corporate denizen to coach. Now, for those in our audience, coaching profession doesn't pay as well as a job in finance. So you walked Correct. away from a very financially sound decision to yes. shaky ground on where your career was going to go, what opportunities would be in your future, but also what you could earn in that moment. So what was it like for you to make that decision to choose your passion over the safe road? Well, I'll tell you what, AJ, I was convinced that the money didn't bother me because we grew up, my, my, you know, my mom and dad, neither one of them went to college, right? So we grew up very working class and my dad worked for the city of Chicago. My mom was a homemaker until my sister and I got to high school. Then she was a secretary at a bank. So I always felt, listen, I can exist on non-investment banker money because I, I grew up that way, right? So I wasn't a, the, the money for me, wasn't afraid, but I had two young children mm. that I was responsible for, and I was going through this horrible divorce, so I didn't, didn't want to change their lifestyle. So I said to myself, let me just see what their reaction would be to me taking to this job. And my kids, my two older kids were eight and four at the time eight-year-old boy, four-year-old girl. And I said, listen, guys, daddy's going to take a new job. And the first thing they thought was we had to move. That I was moving away. And I was like, nope, nope, not moving away. I'm going to still be here, but I'm going to be a coach. And I was, in my mind, thinking like an adult. Nice house, nice cars, nice vacations all down the drain, right? Because yeah. as, you, as you mentioned, AJ, the assistant coaching job is I might have been making forty five fifty thousand dollars tops, right, at a Big Ten school. So my son says, "Does that mean that your office is a gym?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, my office isn't a gym, but it's right next to the gym." And my daughter chimed right in. Now she's four years old. Right after she said, "Do they have a pool there?" And when she said that. I knew I was taking the job because they, I mean, uh, this whole time I'm thinking they're going to be devastated. Their lives are going to change. They had no idea what their lives were, right? right? They were just excited that their dad was going to, his office was going to be a gym that had a pool next to it. And so that's what made my decision. I had already, you know, my dad had said to me working Every day of his life for the city of Chicago, he never took any days off until he passed away. And he had MS, multiple sclerosis, went to work every day. And he always said to me, if you can ever find a job that you love doing, take it. You won't feel like you work a day in your life. He was not at that kind of a job, but he knew what he was striving for. And that was always in the back of my mind. So I really didn't 
think much about the change in financial situation. And I was right, because once I got there, I absolutely loved my job to the point where I would tell anybody, any of your listeners out there, if you have the opportunity to just try something you love, do it so that at least you know what you're missing, because there's nothing wrong with chasing a dollar. I Listen, right. if you want to do that, do that. Also should know what you're missing if you have the opportunity to do something you really love, like being a musician. You mentioned starting a little yeah. bit later than a normal coaching career. Most go yeah. directly from player to coach. So talk a little bit about that ego for yourself, jumping into a new career at 35 when a lot of your peers are younger, further along, they've been in it longer. What was that like for you? Not a heavy lift at all, AJ. I've been really fortunate to have some really good parents, mentors, coaches along the way. And I think having played a team sport helps you understand what sacrificing your ego does for the whole team. And so that helped me in that position of being sort of one of the older assistant coaches who's doing all the grunt work. But I didn't look at it that way. I looked at it as just this huge opportunity to learn something new. And and nowadays, you know, we're talking 30 something years ago, now maybe not quite 30 years ago, 20 something years ago. And people have a have a term for it now. It's called lifelong learner, right? Everybody yeah. has this term talking about lifelong learning, which is funny to me because we have all these great terms now that people were doing stuff back in the day that we, we didn't have a term for it. But my parents always said, always be willing to learn new things. And they said that to me and my sister when we were, shoot, eight, nine years old, you know, when you're old enough to understand those kind of philosophical ideals. And I just was like, this is great. I'm learning something new at, you know, 37 years old or 36, whatever I was at the time. And I also, you you know how you, as you get older, you bring some maturity to your thought process too. I knew that there were some things that I was bringing to the table as an older assistant coach or an older, newer assistant coach that I could share with those folks. Like, and I'll use this as a perfect example. When I got into coaching, people were still using index cards for recruiting. Like you kept, tra- like it was a contact manager, right? Of <laughs> index cards. Now I, I had been, you know, in sales and trading, investment banking, your contacts were all done on the computer so that, you know, if you're on the phone with somebody, you just click on their name and you can see what you said to them the last time. I was like, everybody does it. And it was the whole industry. The whole industry was still doing it that way. And I sort of said, you know, you can automate this. This makes your life a whole lot easier. And that was just something that that I brought to the table. But I didn't have a big challenge ego-wise. Again, I was having a blast and I was learning new things. And the enthusiasm that comes with working with young people I vowed at that point that I was always going to have young people around me because those guys and gals all made me feel young. As the older I got, the younger I felt, they just have this energy about them that just makes you want to go to work every day. I was just going to say, Craig, you bring up a good point, which is about young people then getting acquainted and being part of a group and whether that uh, that group is going to be the collective of of a team sport or a, mm-hmm. a, a political or scholastic organization. And for a lot of kids, sports is the first time that they're not going to look at themselves as an individual. Or even if they are an incredibly talented kid, um, his individualism is the first thing to go getting into a team sport because he has to learn to work with others. And especially for the talented kid that he may think, hey, I'm better than everybody here. Well, your role is to bring up everybody around you as a team because you're now a part of something that is bigger than you, which is going to be stronger, which is going to protect you and your family. And the stronger that team or organization is the stronger those bonds 
the more it can accomplish. Yeah, exactly. And Johnny, I love individual sports too. But there is that dynamic of being a part of a team where you have to do exactly what you said. If you're the best guy, you got to bring everybody up. If you're not the best guy, you got to figure out how you're going to fit in. And then there's always the person who thinks they should be the best guy, but they aren't really. And you can show them how to behave in that role because that is learned behavior for most people. Because you come up in your family, you're either the best guy or your brother was the best guy and you were the second best guy or your your sister was the best student or you were the second best student. But you always thought, I, I'm going to catch that person. It's a great learning environment, team sports at an early age. And I'm just, although I, I see us moving in the wrong direction with youth sports, it's turning into a, a money making racket unfortunately, but the concept of playing on a team at a young age is still extremely important. Yeah. And if you're the a talented kid and you're coming into that team and you don't have the seniority, you have to learn to be patient, to bide your time, to help the other guys and that you will get your shot if you are patient and the diplomacy that you're going to learn is going later to lead, allow you to be a leader of men. You're not going to learn to be a leader of men being hyper individualistic. And it's also, and I'm sure you had to do this with some of your players as well, where they actually had to sacrifice maybe their moment of glory for the team. And it may be the first time that they ever had to learn that lesson as well. Because at the end of the day, that sacrifice makes the team better, and which is the ultimate goal for that. Yeah, yeah. The hardest part about coaching basketball, in my opinion, is having a really good player where you have to tell them, in order for you us to win, you have to score fewer points. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the hardest discussion to have, and intuitively, <laughs> nobody can believe it. Well, coaching, much like leadership, has evolved over the years. And I know my dad's boss had a much different dynamic than what I would want from my boss. We know the classic coaches like Bobby Knight throwing chairs and getting in players' faces. And you look at the cool, calm, collected coaches now who have a stronger bond with their players, aren't building that hierarchy, top-down, authoritarian view around how to build a winning team. What have you seen in your coaching career as the evolution of leadership and how does that translate to those who maybe aren't coaching but want to be better leaders? The thing that's at the top of the list for me, guys, that I see now, and it it was great because in my evolution from being a player into being a coach over these years, I've had to implement a lot of the stuff. But the thing that I noticed the most is that Coaches nowadays have to be, and leaders too, right? So this is leadership. You know, when I was managing a trading desk, it was the same thing. You have to be empathetic as a leader. You have to understand. And and this was something that I started hearing about as a child with my parents. My, My parents always said, never underestimate what the other person's plight is. Nobody talks or uses that word anymore. Their plight, right? That way you can understand why they do some of the things they do. And no no coach was empathetic in my day growing up. It was military. It was corporal punishment. It was my way or the highway. And as we've evolved and learned more psychological and emotional intelligence type of behavior, you have to understand where these young people are and the term meeting them where they are, that's what you're seeing coaches are doing now. And I also think that's what you're seeing what, what good leaders are doing now. Because to me, good leaders, good coaches are trying to get people to do what they couldn't do on their own, right? Because if they could do it on their own, you wouldn't need us, right? You wouldn't need any coaches. But people have a ceiling on their own and can be pushed to higher heights with the help of good leadership, good coaching. And I think understanding where everybody is vis-a-vis everyone else and being able to explain why you're where you are, how you get to be at the top. And if you're at the top, what do you have to do to stay there? You have to sort of understand where people are coming from. And I would say that's the biggest thing 
that I've noticed. The second uh, biggest thing is there's way more communication now between coach and player than it was when I was coming up as a player. It, like I said, it was either my way or the highway. Stop asking so many questions. Go execute. Now, these kids aren't raised that way anymore. So when you are, and I shouldn't say kids, I should say people aren't raised that way anymore. They want an explanation for what you're asking them to do and how it is going to affect their lives. And a lot of times they want to see you lead by example too. They want to see you leaning in and performing at your best to be a peak performer before they want to take that leap themselves. You know, and I've seen not only in the coaching environment, but in the leadership environment in corporate that they're looking to leaders who lead by example, who have their own habits, who have their own routines for their performance before they turn around and say, okay, I need you to perform. Yeah. And, you know, gone are the days when you sort of, because, I, you know, what I found interesting moving out of athletics into the corporate America, there was a lot of line skipping in corporate America where you can't have line skipping in athletics because the guys you're skipping over the line are trying to beat your brains out to be in front of you, right? So there's actual objectivity to it and not just subjectivity. And so that is a really good point, especially in corporate America where you, you know, sometimes the best salesman didn't get to be the sales manager. Sometimes it was the worst salesman because he wasn't a good salesman. They made him a manager. Right Now you can't do that because it, to, to your point, AJ, people want to see that you can do the job that they're doing. Yeah. They want to believe in what's going on and what you're asking them to do. You know, I think yeah. in the past we defaulted to the hierarchy and the structure and now we're seeing with the rise of technology and the fact that everyone is out there bleeding for their role, that they want to see you in the trenches. They want to see that you're following through on what you're asking of them, especially the younger generations Indeed. who are being asked to walk the fire. So you've had some amazing guests on the show so far. What have been some of the key takeaways or interesting insights that have been shared with you? Whoa, wow. One of the more recent ones was Dave Roberts, who was the manager of the Dodgers. And to, to the point that we were just talking about, one of the really neat takeaways was that he talked about how he has to have an individual relationship with every single one of his players. Now, in basketball, we do that, but we only have 15 guys on the team. You got 40 something guys on the team and you have to have a personal relationship with every single one of them. I found that to be really interesting. And he uses his players to send a lot of his messages so that they don't get tired of hearing from just him. I love that because not only do you keep your voice fresh, but you create community within the team right? And accountability with each other. I absolutely loved hearing that and uh, just understanding, because I'm a, I'm a baseball fan, but I'd never really gotten into the sort of behind the scenes machinery of how you manage that many guys. Because I think about football where you're sort of the head coach doesn't all necessarily have a relationship with all 80 guys, right? right. He's got Position coaches. 11 coaches and, and posi yeah. yeah, position coaches and specialty coaches and this, that, and the other. So that was really neat. Well, Some I'd love to unpack ones. that a little bit more because I think there's a few yeah, sure. key points there. You know, sure. the first piece, obviously, we were talking about empathy and to build a personal relationship with each team member. You know, that is you bringing empathy into it and saying, hey, what's going on with your family? What's going on outside of what we're doing here on the field? And the second thing that really strikes me about that is obviously when you have that many games, you can't worry too much if you're on a hot streak or a cold streak. You got to stick to your habits and your routines and trust in the process that mm -hmm. you've laid out at the start of the season, knowing that it'll all sort itself out over the entire summer and early fall. You can't get too in the mud around, oh my God, we've lost three in a row and we're struggling and they're beating us up in the press. Right. It was absolutely eye-opening. But I just love the group accountability, right? And with pros, it's just they treat each other differently than college players. Like, you know, pros have their own families. They're all not trying to hang out. Like the young guys hang out with each other 
and the older guys are with their families. And the time they hang out is when they're on the road together. So that was a real interesting dynamic. Another guest, we had Dawn Staley on, and she's fantastic and is one of those people who has been successful at a very high level as a player, as a coach, as a person, as a leader. She shared with us that this year's team, she thought had really didn't have a shot at winning the national championship because she had lost the bulk of her players, players yeah. and had to replenish that team and just wasn't thinking they would catch on as quickly as her teams where she had fewer transfers. And, you know, everybody in the college ranks are replenishing their teams with transfers just as much as they're doing it with high school, and maybe even more so depending on the team than the prospective student athletes coming out of high school. So she thought this was going to be a really tough year, but her ability to get them to give themselves over to her. And these are my words, not hers. She wasn't saying that's what happened, but that's what I saw happen. And she said, they just decided to do what we asked them and do it over and over and build that habit and build the culture. And that was the, uh, an example of where you've had so much success that you built some credibility. And you talked about earlier People want to see you doing what you're asking them to do. Well, she's done it a bunch of times, and it was easier for her to convince these folks to jump in the boat with her. I thought that was fascinating. You know, looking at that right there, having to identify young leaders, when you're replenishing a team and leaders are leaving, you're going to have to count on some sophomores, some freshmen, some young leaders, maybe earlier than they expected to even lead. So walk us through as a coach and as a leader, how you identify those attributes and talents that might make someone a young leader. And then how do you give them that ability and that opportunity to then grow into that leader? Yeah, that's a, a terrific question. And the way I did it was in the recruiting process, right? When I'm taking a look at high school players, you look at the guys who are not only really skilled and good enough to play at your level. When I was at Oregon State and we were in the Pac-12, we had to find guys who could compete in the Pac-12 with guys who were going to be pros. And so when I was looking at, at high school students, I always look for skill and talent first, right? So you want to make sure you got the raw materials to compete. But then after that, you looked for little things like how they relate to their teammates, how they relate to their family, what the teachers who have had them in multiple classes feel about them, and the teachers who only had them once in four years, what did they think about them? And then there is the sort of what we used to call the it factor. That's uh, to give you an example of the it factor. You know, we all have our group of friends but when there's always that one person, the party doesn't really get started till that guy gets there, right? Like you're, you, you know, we could all be there, but the, if this one guy's not there, it's not really time to really get jamming. But once he's there, okay, we feel like we're, we're, we're all together. I look for that. And that's hard to find, but you can get it from teammates, from coaches. Coaches can sort of give you a good insight to the players who have that sort of likability along with talent. Yeah, I think that is really a key that is missing in a lot of these scenarios when we want to become leaders is we often don't think about the likability. <laughs> we, we think about our talents and our skills first that got us that opportunity to become a leader, but ultimately transitioning beyond individual contributor, beyond just your skills and talents, you need likability to get people on board, to influence and persuade them to join the mission, whether it's an entire season of basketball or whether it's an initiative at work. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad I, I used that term because that is an underused term even today, right? Not, not many people are talking about likability because sometimes likability gets grouped in with sort of goofballness or good, you know, guy, kind of, the guy's a goofball. But that's not what I mean. I mean, likability as in you admire this person. You like being around them. They are a treat to be around. 
that is to me almost as important as the talent. Like in sports, you have to have the talent. You can't win with likability, but you find a the right player who's got talent and likability, your teams are going to win a lot of games. And with that likability comes authenticity. Sometimes you got to get in people's face and tell them, hey, you're not performing up to your best. We saw what you were capable of in practice. We saw what you were capable of on this last project. We need that from you now. And likability is what allows that to happen, is what allows the other person to hear it and then play up to their best instead of get back in conflict with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That likability leads to accountability. Now, sports is all about winning. (laughs) Unfortunately, we can't win them all. And even the best still lose and we have to bounce back. And many of us in our career are going to face setbacks and losses and not get the things that we want out of our career trajectory. So what is your advice for those who are facing defeat, trying to bounce back from defeat? And how would you do that in terms of a coach with a team to really reset the mindset to get them back to winning? Yeah, let me start with the second part of that first, because that's what I know and I vividly remember. It was really interesting. You know, by the time I got to be a Division I head coach, you have been a part of so many games. You understand that most competitors, they don't appreciate winning as much as they underappreciate losing, if that sounds right, right? So what I'm saying is you win a game and by 11 o'clock at night, like you play a game at six or seven in the evening, you win the game, you're happy until about 11 o'clock at night, and then you start preparing for the next game. You lose, you feel that until you win again. So the process of getting over losses takes way too long if you allow it to. And what I've learned at a program where you're cooking, like uh, Duke, North Carolina, Kentucky, UCLA, where you're winning most of the time, you have to figure out how to manage losing. And how I wanted to do it with my players was, okay, let's mourn this loss until the next practice, not the next win. Because otherwise you're mourning more than you're working. So we worked real hard at, okay, let's watch the film. We take 20 minutes. We watch the things we did poorly. Now we're back excited about what we're doing next. And that is learned behavior. (laughs) It's not a natural thing. So my advice to people in the non-sports world is you have to figure out how to manage losing and how to manage setbacks, right? You can't let setbacks consume you until you have a big win because the big wins are hard to come by, right? Absolutely. And you have to look at the fact that you're winning every day but you just don't count it the same. So manage those setbacks so that you don't feel like you're losing all the time because that's sort of the the psyche of humans is we dwell on the negative stuff. Completely agree. You have to teach yourself how to not dwell on it. And in our X Factor Accelerator with our clients, we teach them that skill building creates momentum in your life. And March Madness is all about momentum. Even in the pros, we're watching the finals in the Western Conference, Eastern Conference, and teams are coming back from 20 points down against the second best team in their division. And you're going, these are pros. How are they going down 20? How are they coming back? Because they're managing and creating momentum. As a coach, how do you think about momentum and how can we bring more momentum to our life? I only think about momentum when I'm coaching or in the car right? Momentum's pretty important in the car. It's in the, it's, it's really important in the car and it's important when you're coaching, but I haven't thought about momentum as sort of in your career. I guess I would look at momentum as being sort of positive attitude, right? Let me back up a bit. Steph Curry, I love Steph Curry, not because he's a great shooter, great player, great person, but I love the fact that he talks about the reason why he's such a good shooter is because he's missed so many shots, not that he's made so many, that he's he's taken so many shots and missed so many shots that he has the ultimate confidence that he's going to make shots. And 
if there's some way to to make an analogy in our own lives about that, you can't make the shots you don't take. And the difference between athletes and non-athletes working in corporate America is that athletes are willing to take more calculated risk than non-athletes are. Yeah. Part of that calculated risk is acquiring skills and stacking those skills to your advantage. That's what creates the unique opportunities for you. And unfortunately, you can't build skills without missing those shots, just like Steph Curry. You know, the best shooter in the world is going to miss six out of 10 shots. <laughs> he's the best and he's still going to miss six. It doesn't mean he's afraid to get up in the next opportunity and fire away. But you have to keep that in mind. Even the best are missing 60%. Yeah. And then going back to that term we were talking about, uh, being open-minded to learn more, lifelong learning, that is a way to keep your momentum going. Being willing to change, being willing to learn more, being going outside your comfort zone. I think that from a non-athletic sort of real world environment, that is a way to keep your momentum going. Be willing to change. Be willing to learn new things. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. Johnny and I have really yeah. enjoyed the latest podcast. Where can our audience find out more about the show? Anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. We are everywhere. And it's Ways to Win. It's Coach John Calipari from the University of Arkansas and myself, Craig Robinson, and just excited that you guys like it. And by the way, The Art of Charm, I love that title, that name, because, you know, nobody uses the word charming anymore. We're trying to bring it back. We've been on a mission. Bringing it back. That used to be, like, if somebody said you were charming, that was the greatest compliment. That was better than being handsome. Now it's all about the riz. <laughs> Now it's all about the Riz. See, it's just, I love when I, the art of charm. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Thank you, Craig. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it.